Hello everyone, what's going on? Gareth the Master974 back again today doing another Valve source code tutorial follow-up video. Now this video I wanted to do for quite a while and never really found the right opportunity to make it. And now that I've got some free time tonight, I'm just gonna do a recording and just hope I cover everything that I want to. So just for a bit of background for this video, I've done episode 13, Basics of Con Commands, where I go over a way of extracting the answer to the factorial of an input number using an array uh, as an example of a con command that passes through an input argument in this case any positive whole number up until 32 i believe in this case and i did a follow-up to this tutorial where i talked about variable limitations because there's issues where you can end up with numbers that are bigger than the maximum allowed amount that a particular parameter is allowed to have. So in the case of a uint64, I believe I said that the amount was of the order of 18 quintillion or something like that. And so I just go over some details about research that I did and figured out what the highest number you could go to is to get perfectly accurate answers using a coded method like this. Now, one of the things I mentioned, I believe it was in the con command original tutorial, was about the usage of the static keyword. So I'm just going to briefly cover this and hopefully CPP reference is good enough. But in particular, if you look up the static keyword, this is outside of a class definition. So it tells us to see stu you know, storage duration. We go to storage duration and I believe it's somewhere here that the static specifier is only allowed in the declarations of objects and uh, when used in a declaration of a class we don't care uh, but for an object it specifies static storage duration and so if we go down here then it says the storage for the object is allocated when the program begins and deallocated when the program ends and only one instance of the object exists so i believe it means you can't overwrite the object in this case the con command gets defined and you're not able to you know, replace it with anything, otherwise you'll get errors and stuff like that. Now, I do believe there are cases where you can override values, like static values, but typically if you think about a for loop or a while loop and you have a static parameter, then it's not going to get reset to the value that you initialize it with. So, for example, you can have a static int called zero and then add one to the int in this case but then once the loop starts again it's not going to be set to zero again it's going to have the value of one that because it's not overridden it only gets uh initialized one time i believe that's what the static keyword is doing in this context and hence why you would want to use it so any of your con commands that you specify don't get overridden by someone else now because of this tutorial in particular the follow-up tutorial where I go over the variable limitations, I don't go over cases where you exceed the you know the variable limits. I say it all falls apart, but I don't go any further into it. And that's why this tutorial exists because I've figured out exactly what happens and I'm going to go over some examples today. So I've got this uh, basic Python script here. Um, don't mind this import numpy as np, that's just getting a package that we need. And so I've got a test integer here, which is defined as a 32 bit integer. And just for some simplistic memory reasons, I'm going to basically typecast this 32 bit integer as a 16 bit integer and print the results. And we'll move on to doubles and floats in a moment. So if I just run this real quick, then you'll see that the answer is 32,767, as you might expect. But what happens if we set the value to be 32,768? Now you might think, well, it's just going to be 32,768, right? Well, if we run it, it's minus 32,768. So what the hell's that all about? What about 32,769? It's minus 32,767. Like, that's not right, is it? And the simple answer to this is this integer, especially this parameter, is overflowing. 
Now you can imagine this as kind of like a circle. So I have this example here and if you go right at this keyframe um, right over here then we basically wrap around the entire memory address space if you will and we end up going over into this next area and so we can overflow and wrap around to the lowest possible amount and then go up through there so in the case i've just outlined over here then what happens is a 32-bit integer a 32-bit signed integer at that actually has a lower value of minus 32768 but it has a maximum value of 32,767. Now, why does it only go to 32,767? Well, the simple answer is because you go through zero. So just as a little exercise, count from zero to five. Well, you go zero, one, two, three, four, five. Oh, we define six numbers and not five like you might expect. And because we have to define two to the power of 32 numbers, you know, we can't uh, go to 32,768 because we go through zero. So we'd actually need 33 bits to be able to go to 32,768. So just as we can overflow, if we have a value of minus 32,769, then it's going to wrap around to the maximum possible value of 32,767. And so that is an example of integer overflow. And this is exactly what's happening with the factorial method that I outlined. So I've got another little bit of code here. I copied what the maximum integer was from Visual Studio, at least as defined in the Valve source code. And this is the maximum value of a 64-bit unsigned integer. I've got a factorial function written here in Python. It's exactly the same as uh, what I did in the uh, valve source code tutorial follow up. And what I'm going to do is print the value of the maximum integer, print the value of factorial 21. And initially, I was going to do this tutorial with this top line, um, but I realized you could just end up using the modulo operator and it gives you the same kind of answer. So if we just run this, then we've got a maximum integer of 18 quintillion, but factorial 21 is about 51 quintillion. So we end up overflowing by 14 quintillion. And if I show you what you would get in the source engine, then you'd realize this is the exact same number. That is exactly what's going on. So I could easily change this to 22 for all of these cases. And it should result in the same kind of answer. Again, that's what the value of 22 factorial is supposed to be but we end up getting this answer instead. And all of this is because we're cramming too much of a number inside of a data container and it's just overflowing. And that's what the answer apparently is if you were to use a 64-bit unsigned integer, but it's not the answer because we've just gone outside the bounds. So a popular example of stuff like these... Uh, Overflows is, of course, Super Mario 64. You might have heard of the game, you might not. But in particular, there is a specific function in that game called Find Floor. And it outputs an F32 value. It passes through some F32 positions. But then there is a, you know, awful little bit where we see S16 equals S16 of XPOS and XPOS is an F32. So if we look up what an F32 is and what S16 is, then we'd realize that an F32 is a float and an S16 is an int. So what's happening in Mario 64 is that we have a 32-bit floating point number that is getting typecasted to a 16-bit integer, I guess. So that is problematic because it allows for stuff like parallel universes and misalignments to exist. And you can find more information on Pan and Coic's YouTube channel and also the Bismuth documentary of the A Button Challenge. Very good channels to check out, let me tell you. And it goes into better visualizations than I can and way more, you know, just detail about Mario 64 in general. And so that is 
pretty much what I've tried to outline with this little special function over here called the Mario 64 floor checker. So it imitates the behavior. So this is like a valve source code version of this kind of floor detection, you know, this, this floor, I can't even say it, floor detection position function or something like that. I, I know I can't speak. There's always got to be like one fuck up in these videos, but it's quite simple. You can just go through if you really want to. And as I say here, this is where the magic happens. It's because I have a short, which is basically a float and it's the player's position dot x and y the z is just the height so we don't care about that necessarily but we are truncating it to an 8-bit integer and so i've got a little function a little test to say that if the position is greater than or equal to negative 128 but it's lower than 128 and it applies both to the x and the y coordinates then we're going to say the player is in bounds otherwise we're out of bounds so you might think, well, if you go outside of negative 128 or higher than 128, then it's going to say that we're out of bounds. But what you'll find out is that it doesn't say that because of overflows, as I've mentioned. So I'll show some footage of the map in question where you see this in action. And anywhere you stand in the map will pretty much always trigger the player is in bounds because of the way that I've constructed this scenario, that it's always going to say that the player's in bounds. And so if it was Mario 64, then any of the points that you can be at is valid positions as far as the game's concerned, when actually your real position is way, way, way outside of the confines of the map. So again, that's what parallel universes are in Mario 64. So I thought I'd just uh, go over that. And as I said, that integers are kind of like circles. You can go around in a loop and overflow and go to zero. Uh, but floating point numbers, unfortunately, aren't that lucky. They kind of operate like a standard norm number line, like you might expect a standard number line. And the memory structure is kind of like this. You get one bit for the sign, seven bits for the exponent or the power and 24 bits for the mantissa or a decimal portion of the float. And they're scrunched together close to zero. But as you go to higher orders of magnitude, they begin to separate more and more by greater and greater amounts. So again, Pan and Coic, great channel to check out for this stuff. And you do hit limits at around 10 to the power of 38, which is the maximum amount of, you know, stuff you can cram into a float. And if you exceed that, then you go to infinity. So I'll outline this with this example that I've got over here. Let's print this example float and see what happens. Oh, it's infinity. We've tried to give a float a value of 10 to the 40, which is allowed by a double, but not by a float. So in this case, we exceed the value of a float and it just goes straight to infinity. So if you do that, then yeah, you'll be given a value of infinity and doing anything with infinity will just give you the answer infinity, unfortunately. And there's all this other stuff I've got down here, which is um, just for information purposes. So I give information about a uint64. It tells you what the lowest and maximum allowed value is. And for float 32, it gives you, again, the kind of maximum extent. It's 3.4 times 10 to the 38. So if you try to give it a value of 10 to the 40, it's just going to go to infinity right away. So the yeah, maximum integer value is around 1.8 times 10 to the 19. And for a float, it's 3.4 times 10 to the 38. And so if you ever had the situation where you wanted to show off and code a factorial like function and you wonder why the answer goes negative or you can only go so far before it all breaks down and falls apart well it's because of variable limits and overflows and underflows underflows being this case where you go in the negative direction and it suddenly wraps around to a very large positive number so i believe that's everything that i needed to say in this tutorial i hope you found this helpful entertaining and useful I know I might have screwed up in places and gone off the rails a little bit and definitely this was not done the way I wanted it to but at least I got it done in the end 
Let me know what you think in the comment section down below if I'm wrong on anything or if anything could be done to improve the series. And I'll see you next time for whatever I decide to do next. So take care out there, peace out, and see you later.